You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Okay. How is everybody doing? Talking about Wendy today and her role. And of course, Donna and Charlie throwing Wendy under the bus in these jailhouse calls. Kind of amazing. And I, it's really funny the way these things happen. I was, my email has been totally messed up. So I got an email from a listener, bossy Texas chick. She sent me her YouTube channel and I was listening to that beforehand. And she has a really quite touching video uh, imploring Wendy to come clean, tell everything she knows that she's going to prison anyway. (laughs) And it is a really optimistic video. It's in the description of this video. Anything I talk about, usually I link in the description of the video. If I don't do it beforehand, just wait a few minutes after the show and I will usually include those in the show notes. But we are dealing with sociopaths, psychopaths, antisocial personalities. So even if she knows it's better, even if she knows it's going to turn out better for herself, her ego will not let her. And I feel like That is the discussion. Who is going to flip on who? So her ego will not let her admit that she was a part of this. I believe everyone in the Adelson family will go to their grave saying they had nothing to do with it. It was all a coincidence. And I don't see Charlie flipping because I don't see the state, A, offering anything, and B, I don't think he'll ever admit it. I think he's going to keep crying that he's been wrongfully convicted, LOL. And I think he's going to go right back to Josh Dubin, and that's the movement he comes from. The Innocence Project and the Wrongful Conviction Movement and and go to those people and try to get a campaign. I think there's one jailhouse call, and forgive me if I was listening to so many of them and I misunderstood, but where he's talking about hoping that a documentary gets made. And that's how so many of these innocence fraud campaigns get started with a documentary. The jury got it wrong. They didn't understand this extortion defense. So if a documentarian is looking to make some kind of true crime documentary with a new story, you can certainly go that route. And we've seen it pay off so many times, making a murderer. West Memphis three documentaries. Oh gosh. Amanda Knox. How many? I mean, look at my channel. They are well, well looked at on this channel. And the transcripts of the trials tell a totally different story. But it's a money machine. Fantastic comments got from you guys. Let's get into it. Jane 6216 says, I can't say it enough. This is what those kind of families do. It's like uh, their form of church. One member gets on their high horse and gives their speech or sermon. The rest just nod and agree and add little chirps here and there. (laughs) That's such a great analogy, Jade. 
<laughs> That's exactly what the calls were. I called it a, a backup singer. Donna was like a backup singer for Charlie. And I woke up with such a headache listening to all of Charlie Adelson's ramblings. <laughs> I can't tell you. And just amazing that he has such stamina and can go on and on saying the same things over and over again. And there's Donna willing to back him up. Okay, back to Jane's comment. I married into this. And it's something to behold. When you're not from this and you try to step in and bring another perspective, they shout it down very quickly. They don't want truth. They want to hear themselves bolstered. They want their fake security. At the end of the day, it's all they have. Super insightful. And yes, it's like a cult. And the minute you say the truth, you become public enemy number one. That's right. They shout you down. No, that's not true. And they hate you for it. They don't like, these kind of families do not like reality. Kimmer, 1967 says, Hi, Roberta. I think that Donnie, Donna, excuse me, and Charlie's delusions were fed by Rashbaum. According to these calls, Rashbaum was telling them that he expected an acquittal. I can't believe they are not blaming Dubin for picking an unsympathetic jury. The obsession with Georgia is off the charts. As for positive comments about Charlie's testimony, there were many people who were disappointed that Georgia failed to rattle him in, on cross. That's true. I believe that is where they are finding positive comments. What Charlie and Donna do not realize is that the questions asked on cross are what matters. Charlie's answers do not matter because he is expected to be contrary. There are very few gotcha Hollywood cross examinations in reality. Georgia asked the right questions and the jurors were able to see the defense for the train wreck that it was. Yeah, exactly. You saw that in the Durst trial. Robert Durst did very well on direct. He had his whole story. He was doing a staycation. And then on cross with John Lewin, he admitted that he would lie if he had committed this murder, he would lie about it. And then he admitted that he committed perjury. I think it was five times already in the trial. <laughs> so, and he, there was a couple gotcha moments, Hollywood style goosebump moments in that cross of John Lewin, who's been a guest on this podcast multiple times. Brilliant, brilliant prosecutor. Elliot 485 says Dan is Dan Rashbaum, and we need another name for him. I think that was the society page who said that last night. <laughs> Rashi, how about Rashi, is the worst attorney. When I began watching the trial, I thought he was the prosecutor. He needs a dream team like OJ because he's guilty. Yeah, they're only so much a defense attorney can do with these all these bad facts. And the O.J. Simpson trial had something else. And if you've watched the excellent documentary, O.J. Simpson Made in America, it's one of the really few really decent <laughs> true crime documentaries, in my opinion, really explores what came before and it really connected to the outrage over race in Los Angeles at that time. Without that, and with a jury who was more educated and understood DNA better, I don't know if that team would have succeeded. There's only so much that any one defense attorney can do. We like to think that they're like, can come in, like they're some kind of magical beings and can come in. 
and change the whole direction of the trial. But with Charlie Adelson's case, in his case, you can't do much. He's so unlikable. And because it's such a circumstantial case, all the, I'm going to use Rashi's word, puzzle pieces fit together and tell a story. I'm going to take a quickie break. When we get back from the break, I'm going to look at Donna and Charlie Adelson's amazing jail record, jailhouse recordings where they blame Wendy for everything. Don't go anywhere. Meet you on the other side of the break. If you are enjoying this episode of my True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Okay, this is going to be a problem. I'm going to have to take a little bit of a break, guys. I'm really sorry, but I cannot hear anything through my headphones. I was listening beforehand, before the show. I don't know what's going on. And I will try to fix it. But that's what I thought. That's why I played my break stuff, my break, (laughs) my little commercial there because I couldn't hear my intro music and I can't hear anything coming through my headphones. So I'm going to take a quickie break, talk amongst yourselves, and I will try to fix this. Okay. Thanks so much for your patience. Yeah, I think I think it's working. I will try now. It seemed to work. I don't know what that was about, but we will proceed on. Here is Donna and Charlie talking about Wendy. And of course, this comes after an incredible lot of them, Charlie complaining about his trial in Tallahassee and the jury, but now they're getting into Wendy. Wendy's the real problem. It's her testimony and it's her driving by the crime scene, which I think is the strongest piece of evidence. It's so interesting that both Donna and Wendy have made the strongest piece of evidence is evidence against themselves. Donna by fleeing and Wendy by driving by the crime scene. Unbelievable. They're so similar. And you think he's guilty, you don't feel I think people fucking hated me. And they they used all of this extraneous stuff of like when he advanced the worst and tumultuous, but most of them are bizarre. But like they made it out to they, they made it out like I mean they, they painted such a fucking picture there was uh there was not a chance in hell I was going to get a fair shake in That's just the best you 
I want to tell you, we, we, were, we were where you were over that weekend. We were all where you were. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody thought anything different other than pretty obvious. And yeah. He put on an amazing case. Charlie yeah. testified perfectly. Yeah. It's done. He got it. Yeah. Everybody said the yeah. same thing. We were, we were very happy. Isn't that interesting that Donna says, done, he got it. Like, he snowed the jury. He did it. Not everybody could see that you were telling the truth and that your case was so strong and that, that your side was the side of truth. And the jury was going to all agree with you? No, you got it. It's like you pulled one over on them. You fooled them. Done. Done. It's done. They bought your bag of goods. It's done. What's the problem with these people? Like, it almost should be like a, a do-over if you have such a bad verdict. From, like, but it's the verdict produced by a prosecutor that brought it to the able to bring these mammals well, shit, it has nothing to do with me. But it's enough to make you hate my sister. It's enough to make you hate my mother. It's enough to make you hate me. And it's one thing if they just hate you. It's another thing if they hate your whole family and they feel like you're shitting on them in Miami people coming up here and really, really like belittling us, common folk. There's only one reason why Catherine read that line from her book. There's only one reason that's to drive home the message that Wendy thinks she's smarter than everybody else. She foreshadowed her move in a book. She even wrote a book about the movie. She knew this move was going to happen. She even wrote a book about it. What was the name of that town, Wendy? That you refer to as a small spot in their plan on the way to civilization. I mean, it is, it is kind of crazy that she's she wrote a book and put that in her thing. What? I mean, it is kind of creepy that she she wrote a book and put, and put that line in there with that. And it's so funny. It's because it's like in all his complaining, he's agreeing with the state's case. I guess he and Rashi both agree. Remember Rashi's closing? A lot of their case I agree with. Seems like all of the case Charlie agrees with and can see how he got convicted. Although Donna keeps referring to it as no evidence. Donna doesn't seem to understand evidence. Uh, like she could have left that line out of the book. But she didn't know. Like she was in writing the book. Of course. Of course. Like she could have she could have called the town Biloxi. Through fucking left the line out about it being on a small stop on a fun, this small stop along the way to on the way to civilization. Like it sounds like she's foreshadowing a future event in her book, doesn't it? Well, she made it sound like that. I know. I mean, doesn't this? How many kids does this lady have in the book? Two boys. What is? What does this lady's husband do? Um, he's an English professor, so he's a school professor. What? What school does he teach at? What, what school does he teach at in the book? I don't know. Do you know what? What's that? I don't know. Like what? What school she taught at? I don't. I have no idea. Oh, I read it oh, ages no. ago. So many years ago. I, I think it's. I think it's North Florida State University. Yeah. 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 What we say is that it's just a small stop on the way to civilization. Like that sounds, I mean, I'm just telling you. 
Hiawassee Springs. Isn't that the name of the town in Wendy's book? Why do I know that? And no one in the Adelson family can remember it. But it's all the book's fault. And he doesn't understand why the book was brought in in his trial. Because it shows that Wendy was unhappy. Do we have to spell it out for you, Charlie? It shows that Wendy was unhappy in her marriage and in her life in Tallahassee. So much so that she wrote a book about it to tell everyone how unhappy she was. If, if someone read that life in a book and the author was like the it sounds like she is foreshadowing her big move to Miami. Right before she buys a model and home program. Like, and then she drives by that. And then, did you like the capital that goes? She couldn't help herself. She had to drive out her client to, to make sure it was done. Yeah. Like, that's the only other store she's ever been to in Tallahassee and bought something. So she went home the way they chose to go. That's amazing. But you know what it looks like? Yeah. Oh, it looks like she's. Well, it, 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 that right there is one in a million. That she goes on that day at that time by the street on the house, and then they say that she was she wanted to make sure the job was done. Right. I mean, those things like that. Listen, you can't dispute that she didn't take that route. She took the route. She did, but it, she won. She won, and she was there, and she did a three-four turn. That's right. So, so when, when you're sitting, you're it wasn't where they said. Right. You right. So I'm just saying, like, I guess you could see police table. Hey, who, who knows? But I'm just saying, one says two or three, one says a four or five. But the point is, right. the fact that she put her fucking car there on that time, at that day, on the way out of her way. Is enough for people to go, whoa, she must have known something was going on. There's no way she shows up there on that date, on that time, without without having prior knowledge. She so Charlie agrees that there's enough evidence to not only indict Wendy, but convict her. He says a jury would take one look at that, say that's a one in a million chance. So we have the support now of the Adelson family. Of course, when I talk about the Adelson family, I'm not talking about the oldest son who thankfully was left this family and lives quite a moral and productive and life of serving others as a doctor. But did you hear that, Georgia? You have the full support to indict Wendy. I don't think that they really mean it. What, the, what I hear them saying, and when we say they're talking in code, it seems like they ha a lot of things have double meanings. Like last night we heard Charlie talk about his dog dying and listening to his gut, but he always connects his dog dying with the case. It's always, there always seem to be intimately entwined in how he should have listened to his gut and it's either he's talking about fleeing he should have fleed when katie got arrested but never does it seem to come up either in any kind of double meaning talk that this that they all should not have participated in this it's that they should have done it better so to go back to what i was talking about at the top of the show, which was discussing Bossy Texas Chicks video, no, I don't think that they have it in them even to do what's best for themselves, to fully confess and talk about where they went wrong and to grow and to change. There is no cure for psychopathy. They don't think they did anything wrong. They think it was a good thing, so much so that they went out on a celebration dinner and celebrated it. They celebrated this murder. They hated him. And you can look at Charlie's face during the sentencing hearing, during victim impact statements. 
He's only feeling sorry for himself. They are incapable of remorse. They're incapable of real love, real connection. The only thing they connect to is their ego, image, buying things, getting things, status, and revenge. That's what this whole family is about. There is no depth. Do not make the fatal mistake of projecting your own character makeup onto this family. She's involved. The same nonsense yeah. about the yeah. uh, bullet bourbon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the bullet bourbon got squashed because they had the they had the email. Yeah. That they was, had the invitation. Was, yeah. Yeah. They had the invitation that was sent for two people getting married for a stop the bar party to show that to request a bottle of liquor. Like, yeah, which is crazy. Like, it is crazy. That's crazy. It's crazy. Which is- Does anyone know if this is true? And this is what I've been trying to figure out. I've never seen the stock the bar bar party invite, and Charlie saying it was not admitted into evidence. But I cannot imagine requesting a specific type of alcohol. I think bourbon was requested, but was it bullet bourbon? I don't think so because that's what Donna's saying here, a specific type. So what does that mean? Does that mean a specific brand or specific type? So if bourbon was requested, it wouldn't make sense with Wendy's testimony that she was discussing what kind to buy with the clerk. Remember that testimony? He said, my eyes were so blue. Actually, it wasn't her testimony. It was her, my apologies. It was her police questioning where she's talking about the police clerk to the police that the clerk said her eyes were so blue and they were discussing what brand of bourbon to buy. Because otherwise she would have known. She would have come in and said, I need bullet bourbon. Hand it over. And that's, in fact, what I think happened. I think she bought this with this in mind, with dance murder in mind. It's really hard to put yourself in this mindset, stark person's mindset. But that's what I think happened. It's crazy. I mean, it's crazy. She, she's going to buy a bottle of bullet bourbon to celebrate that night. Like, if she didn't have that email... There's no way, there's no explaining it. She doesn't drink alcohol. There's 5,000 mm-hmm. bottles in the store. She passes by the crime scene and she goes and buys a bottle of bullet bourbon to celebrate that night. Yeah. Insane. There's no, there's no, calling, calling my parents home line, that's not crazy. But yeah. that, driving by the scene, out of her way and going to buy a bottle of bullet bourbon, I would have to say, like, I know. If it, smells, if it smells like shit, it is shit. But no, she really was going to buy a bottle of liquor. She really wasn't. Because, and that's the only liquor store she ever been to. But they, 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 she said, listen, she couldn't help herself. She had to go check it out to make sure it was done. Okay, that sounds really good. It makes her sound like she's a part of it. And if she's a part of it, then I must be a part of it. So, it's which, which story do you think makes more sense? I mean, what is the possible chances of God's green earth that she goes out of her way and drives by that tree from that side on that day? It's insane. It's crazy. It's crazy. It, it, it is. I mean, you just, you, you can't even believe it. Yeah, that's right, Donna. You can't even believe it. You can't even believe it. So here's Charlie just agreeing. He's saying it's unlikely if Wendy's involved and Wendy has to be a part of it because it's a one in a million chance that this is a coincidence. Which story makes more sense? He's saying the state's story makes more sense. Yet he's surprised. He's like, what? They didn't buy? They didn't buy my Latin Kings did a murder on spec? And then put me on a payment plan? What? How dumb are they? how dumb is this jury? 
<laughs> it's so crazy. They're whole, the logic. Don't try to bring logic. It's all emotion. Don't try to bring logic into their reasoning. But what I'm saying is I don't think it was planned that Wendy was not meant to drive by. She just, like Georgia said, could not help herself. She thought she would talk her way out of it. And I went by and I thought that the trees had fallen down. We can go over that video again. Great video on both the Society page and on the Jibbers channel. It shows that it was not a shortcut and she could not be confused as to what was going on. The crime scene tape how many times has a tree gone down and crime crime scene tape is put up with a bunch of police cars? Not often. Try never. You say it, but it's almost like it's things like that yeah. that can make somebody shut out everything else, all the other points that you're saying, and you go, look, on this day, on this time, she leaves her house takes a route that's five miles longer. She drives by the scene on this date at this time. Why on God's fair earth is she doing that to go to a liquor store when she could go to three ones, three of them that are closer? So they're mad. They're mad that Wendy did this. But isn't it interesting that he describes the jury shutting out all the other claims? Not all the other great evidence that we presented. The claims. That's pretty weak. Claims. Not the truth. Not what really happened. <laughs> my claims. The jury didn't buy my claims. It's just, it's called being at the wrong place at the wrong time. But that's not a good explanation. The explanation they want to hear, she's a part of it. She knows. She has to know. How else would she be there? And that's what the jury listens to. And they go, I mean, to me, does that make sense? I mean, uh, if I want a jury, yeah. She's showing up, isn't she? Crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. crazy. Fucking crazy. But think about it. Yeah. What are, the, what are the statistical chances of her leaving her house and driving by that scene on that date at that time and not getting involved? Yeah, I mean, it's insane. It, it, it is. It's absolutely crazy. It's crazy. But it's true. It's what happens. Yeah, but it's what, yeah. it's what happens. But I'm asking, what are the chances that her husband oh. was just murdered? She's, She's leaving her house and driving by the crime scene, but has no knowledge of anything going on. And they made a big deal like, well, why didn't she call daycare? Why would she call daycare? She got a tree fell. That's exactly because she, it used to happen all the really time. Yeah. Because it happens in summer storms and the trees fall. And like she just was like, on and on. Like, they didn't think anything of it. They saw a tree fell and they were cornering her off and they cut the tree and went up the road and went over. But um, what are the, ch I mean, like if I was sitting at the bar and somebody was telling me the story, that's one part of the story I have a really hard time getting over is what is she doing there on that day at that time, leaving her house to, to go around that she doesn't need to go and try to go to turn on the street. Yeah, it's a coincidence, yeah. you know? But people it don't is. like to hear it's a coincidence when no, it's one in a million. No, no they don't. No, they don't. They don't, you can that, was one in a million. that was one in a million. That was yeah. insane. That was one in a million. That was literally. You know what else they don't like to hear? They don't like to hear that the Latin kings killed someone who they didn't know their habits, that they wouldn't be very familiar with, on spec, and then extorted you. And put them on, and then put you on a payment plan. Let you keep 
your fancy cars. What was it? A Ferrari? They were they didn't have any interest in your Ferrari. They weren't like, just hand over the Ferrari. Didn't take any of the stuff that you really liked. Just a just just chump change to you. What would have been monthly? Because they're they're that kind of forward thinking. It's not like they're worried that they're going to get taken off the street at any moment and want to live it up in the moment. No, they're, they like to do good, solid financial planning. That is what the Latin kings are known for. But jury doesn't want to hear that. That's what happened, guys. Anyone who doesn't accept that is just too dumb. They don't like to hear that coincidence. They don't like to hear about the Wendy coincidence. But that's what happened. It all happened just miraculously. All those coincidences fell into place and created a one in a billion shot where Charlie was wrongfully convicted. It was like... It blows your mind. Yeah. Oh, good I mean... What else do you have to say? Like, if I was on that jury and you start hearing, well, okay, that was a coincidence. Okay. And then the TV repairman, the TV joke, the mom saying this TV is about five, lots of TV talk. It's just a coincidence. I wish you picked another object on planet Earth. Other than the TV set to say it costs five, they won't have five thousand dollars. We just said they wanted five thousand dollars. My response was they wanted five thousand dollars. I mean, by the way, you didn't bring up TV until the third call. If TV was a really important code word, what did you have said in call one? First call. What did you have said in call two? Well, you don't mention TV until call three. That's what they don't get. Yeah. But when you put TV, 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 three, three things surrounding that same TV per hour of TV. The TV cost $5,000 and they cost $100 with a TV joke. All over the world. What are the chances of that? What are the chances of TV, TV, TV showing up three times in relation to, I think there has to be some code words. And they give it a code name. Yeah, they, they have, yeah, they have to start be, with all oh, these code words. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It has to be a part of it. It has to. Guess what? had nothing to fucking do with it. Nothing. But listen, if I'm on the jury and I'm seeing I'm seeing the the, the TV joke, the T V repairman at the house on the AT, and then when you're describing how much the guy wants, you have to reference the T V. Guess what? That looks really it's a it's a coincidence. See how this family talks? They're so tuned in. It's really like the comment I read. They're so tuned in with each other. So it's not really a code word. It's really like double meaning. So when they're talking about Wendy driving by the crime scene, what they mean is, why did she do that? That ruined everything. We had everything set up. So there really was a TV repairman there, but he has had another purpose. He had two purposes created. Wendy really did need her TV looked at, right? But the real meaning behind it was something very different. So that's kind of how they talk. They're all in tune. And I don't believe that they've ever explicitly talked about this to each other. I think they're all too paranoid. So they talk about it in ways that if anyone overheard, I mean, you heard Donna, Wendy could talk to us as a lawyer, as a lawyer who doesn't talk. She doesn't talk. They're so paranoid. Everything is divided now into those who can talk, those who know, those that what they could say could implicate implicate them and those that don't talk. We're the family that doesn't talk. We're going to keep our secrets even amongst ourselves. Unsaid. It's really kind of 
But because they're so in tune and because they're all unified in thought and in mission, what's a better way to, I don't know if there's a better way to put that. Their whole mission is to, for Donna and Harvey not get caught and Wendy and Charlie, that was all it, right? Not get caught. And now that Charlie's been caught, it's all support that Charlie's been wrongfully convicted and support this idea that he told the truth on the stand and the jury didn't buy it and Tallahassee was all out to get them. It was all the fault of all the pre-trial and during trial publicity. And he seems to love that this was a big case. His ego loves it. But it, it's a strange because they can't get a problem. I wish I didn't have a repairman there. I wish I never made that joke, but you can all three kind of revolving around the same subject matter. Why? Coincidence. Did, do you see any but evidence in there? No. 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 But coincidence yes. that when they show up, when they show up at the house at that time, on that day, out of her way, 10 miles from her house, leave Georgia Kaplan to go. She had a check to make sure it was done. So if you have, you're sitting there on the jury and you've got to think of one of two things. If, if she showed up there to make sure the job was done, she'd kill herself. If she's guilty, then I'm guilty. Or it was just a coincidence, which is what it was. She thought it was. But it's a one hundred million coincidence. And how many times can you say it's a one in a million coincidence before you're explaining what they think is what are the chances of it being a coincidence? Very interesting. I would love to know what Peter Hyatt would say about these jailhouse calls when he says she's a part of it. I'm guilty when you make these affirmative statements. I'm not a statement analysis. I <laughs> analysis. I don't know. But it certainly seems like they're very comfortable when they're talking about it, owning these things. Wendy was a part of it. If she's guilty, I'm guilty. Be very hard for an innocent person to own all those things verbally. That's at least from the position of someone who studies statement analysis. That's what they would say, I would think. You know, I mean, I hear what you're saying. I mean, then, then you start telling people, they're calling people, playing people for stupid. You know what I mean? It's like, if you want to co poo everything as a coincidence, eventually you're going to be like, wait, the guy is stupid. Like, that was a perfect example of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Like, yeah. But that's I mean, the next thing. They would never back off of it because everyone knows what are the chances you're 10 miles from your house. I mean, how far did she live from it? 10 miles? No. No. Oh, was it? No, I think it was closer. No, it, 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 took, it only took about 15, 15. Notice he doesn't say Wendy was at the crime scene at the wrong place at the wrong time. is always all this vague language. It's it's a coincidence. What is a coincidence? What was the co what what are <laughs> you know? It's all really vague. As are all his pro his protestations of innocence. Minutes and we're talking about slow and mostly back roads. So no I mean, miles, but, uh, six, seven miles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But you look at where you are six, seven miles away, and that's unrelated. Yeah, the only way she knew how to get there, she'd definitely go to, to a liquor store. Right, but there's not a shorter route, but it doesn't matter. You're there, 
on that date, on that time, six miles from your house, and what's the reason? Right. You went out of your way to go to a liquor store when you could have gone another way? That's just creepy. It's creepy. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> but it's just a coincidence. I know. I know. Coincidence. You know, and then her, and then what she wrote in the book, that's just a coincidence. So it's like the TV is a coincidence, showing up there is a coincidence. So How many years ago did you write the book? I don't know. Uh, had it had it had it had it. Oh eight or nine, something like that. Yeah, oh eight. Many years ago. Eight oh eight. Yeah. Yeah, it was a long time ago. It was a quite a bit of a picture for the front page. Yeah. Many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Her, her, she was writing about the immigration lawyer. She's an immigration lawyer. The lady's got two boys. She's got two boys. Her husband, school professor. Her husband was a school professor. She was stuck in some town in the middle of nowhere on the way to civilization. Like, that's a nice slap in the face for a town that sounds just like you're describing you and your family and a town that sounds just like Tallahassee and now you're going to say that's a coincidence? And you were happy in that meeting. All this distance, distancing language she, when he said that lady, I was like, is he talking about Wendy? He was talking about the character in the book, Lily, I think her name is. She's a lawyer. She's a lawyer. She's a lawyer in real life. He never really likes to say her name. And I don't know if that is because they've so used to talking vaguely or if it really does represent a rift between them. But this family seems to have convinced themselves that Wendy is the root cause of everyone getting caught, not their own actions. You talk to somebody about the way to civilization. Like, you, you know, you, you start at the other side and you start holding that together and you gotta, you gotta start explaining to people what the coincidence is and, and it sounds like she's writing about herself. But there's also a, a North Florida State yeah. University. I don't know. It was a school she made up the name. Yeah, she but I'm saying there is a North Florida. No, there's a University of North Florida, something like that. But it, it was like North Florida State University. I mean, it was like one letter off from Florida State. Listen, she, she was probably writing a book about herself. You know, I mean, she was using her characters strong upon herself. But it, it makes it seem like yeah. she, she's just like shooting on Tallahassee and then she's like giving them the middle finger on the way out and writing a book about it. It's, it's just, it's, I know, I, I know. I'm listening to what you're saying and it's just yeah, it was a coincidence after way. coincidence yeah. after coincidence. That's all it was. And it's a book with a line that she never probably thought about, like she just threw in there, like as an offhanded comment, because Tallahassee was a place she probably didn't really plan on staying. She never planned on staying. But like she'd grown accustomed to it and was fine with staying. But like the way it sounds in the book is like she got stuck someplace on the way to civilization. The way it sounds when you're showing up at the crime scene, going out of your way. You live six, seven miles away. Hard to explain. Yeah, it is hard to explain. And that's what we're all waiting for. We're waiting for the day when Wendy, either via her lawyers, if she doesn't choose to testify, or Wendy herself, if she does choose to testify, explains it. She says a tree was down. Under cross, not under immunity. And as for those Castigar issues, that really is for someone who implicates themselves and testifies truthfully. It would be very hard to prove that the state isn't using that to investigate or as a springboard for an investigation. But in a, 
a conspiracy case like this, where you have someone under immunity lying, in my opinion, perjuring herself over and over again, I think those Castigar issues are really unimportant. And as we know, Tim Jansen worked out a Castigar, had those Castigar issues in another case, and worked out immunity deals for his client in another case. So that's going to be on the front of his mind. But I think it is totally a non-starter, in this case, totally unimportant and not applicable in this case. Tell me one thing that Wendy said in her testimony that would become a Castigar issue. Love to hear a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I'd love to hear a lawyer explain more as to why it's an issue. TV set getting repaired on that day. The same TV set that I bought her in the joke. The same TV set in reference when when the hit when the uh, Latin King guy wanted to extort me for money. You need to reference the TV set like three TV sets in a row, all the same topic. Come on now. We're not stupid. Like, I kind of see, like, you're dumbing down coincidences. I mean, if she didn't have that email for the full uh, apartment. Oh, the invitation, yeah. If she didn't have that email invitation. You're dumbing down coincidences. Charlie is so poor at expressing himself. So what he means to say is that the state's explanation dumbed down the truth because the truth was his sophisticated Latin King payment plan extortion defense, which is very intelligent. And it gets dumbed down to they were all part of the murder, but they're all, so this family is so all in, connected, save Rob, in this murder, that there's no way that one person can turn without taking them all down. So they're all just entwined and it's impossible for anyone to break away. The only person I think might, might break away is Wendy just to save herself. And it appears she's already doing that, distancing herself. And we heard the night before last, Wendy's text message to her mom, like, mom, stop texting me about this. And we know that Donna held on to her phone when she was being arrested. She did not want to give up her phone. I'm intimately familiar with the fact that people get very comfortable, too comfortable text messaging things that implicate themselves in crimes. We forget that they can all be looked at. But this family has been. wiretap before so they're really aware that they might be taped over the phone lines that's why he's always calling a landline calling from a landline and i think donna in her paranoid state started to text message wendy and whether it's over whatsapp or some encrypted device or she was deleting her text messages and thinks that the state can't get them remains to be seen. But Donna's trial will be fascinating. I mean, we thought tr Charlie's trial was fascinating. Donna's trial, whoa, cannot wait. And I really do hope I'm wrong and it's very quick. I hope this defense 
does not delay. Because I would be happy if this were tried tomorrow. If Rashbaum is on board and everybody's familiar with the evidence, no one needs any catching up time. Let's go. Donna doesn't want to be in jail. Can't wait. That would look really bad, right? Well, you think you just drive by the crime scene and there's 5,000 bottles in the liquor store and you buy the one that begins in the Yeah. And you buy the only one that says bullet to go celebrate that night? Now you want to tell me that's a coincidence? You're going to say, that's a coincidence now, too? Right. How many times do you want to give an explanation if that's a coincidence? It was. You got the invitation to prove it. Fifteen years ago, TV says it cost a couple thousand. The only few, you know, okay. said what's the most common item that you could think of that cost three, four thousand, five thousand. People with the TV set. What was it? A modest TV. That's what Jeffrey Lacoste said. A modest TV that you'd find in a college dorm room. Did that cost five thousand dollars, Charlie? These things sound good until you know a little bit more. Don't think a TV that size cost $5,000 even back then, Charlie. But he thinks he's a lawyer. He thinks he's a lawyer and a periodontist. <laughs> and we know he barely became a periodontist. Only could become a periodontist with help. There's another part of these tapes I can't remember if I was playing them or not where he said that he worked hard I think I was playing them and he got through school all of them all by himself no one helped him when that's the exact opposite of what happened so reality does not come into the Adelson family's conversations and that's what I mean by cult-like family they have their beliefs. Anybody who doesn't join in with it, we're against them. There's the good people. And when Donna says, everyone believed you, Charlie. Everyone. Everyone thought you were wonderful. Not guilty. I'm sure those are Donna's friends. Because I've been going back to the messages left under comments left under his testimony and try to find the positive comments for Charlie. Try to find them. Everyone thought he did better than they expected. But in my mind, just because he didn't lose it and break down and say, oh yes, Georgia Kappelman, you've caught me in a lie. didn't mean he did well. He, he repeated his tailored story that he practiced over and over and again, in my opinion. He was drilled. Rashbaum playing Georgia Kappelman and Cross. Rashbaum going over, direct over and over again with him in jail. So he was prepared. But it didn't look good when Georgia Kappelman, when he said to Georgia Kappelman, you want to know what call it was? It was call April, I'm just pulling up a date out of my hat, April 22nd, 2016, say. When I said this and that and the other, looked like he was tailoring his story to the evidence. Looks like he had studied the evidence and had tailored a story to it. And the jury picked up on that. It was not the win <laughs> some people in the true crime community thought it was. His testimony was a disaster. You would be better off not testifying. Yeah. Not anymore, but 15 years ago, yeah. You probably, this was, you probably bought your last set in 10. So, yeah, it happened. But it's kind of like when you start telling people, this is a crazy coincidence. This is a crazy coincidence. This is a crazy coincidence. 
that's really hard to start doing that with each fact that comes into the case. No, I, I know. I mean, when you, when you talk about it and analyze it the way you are. You don't need to, you don't need to hear much else. I mean, when it told you how she felt in the book, thank God she had that invitation to email. Charlie, you're breaking up. Charlie? Yeah, I, yeah, I can hear you now. Hello? Okay. Yeah, I, I lost you for a second. I can hear, I can hear you. Okay. I can, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank God she had that email. Yeah. Oh, without that email, if someone told me she drove out of her way, drove out of the car seat, she had to I mean, herself. Of course. She had to herself. Yeah. There's no way there's no way she could have had it. She was going to celebrate that night with a bottle of bullet work. There's five thousand fucking bottles in a liquor store to buy. That's what she buys. Not a bottle of champagne, not beer, not rum, not tequila. There's 50 different kinds of bourbon. She buys bullet bourbon. So they're mad at her. Wendy, why did you buy all these? Why did you buy that kind of bourbon? And it contradicts what they said in the beginning of this call. Or the middle of it, really. I started a little bit into it. Because all these calls are so repetitive. Can you imagine listening to this? Hours of this is Donna, but she loves it. She's ready to echo everything he says. Really like a preacher, like a backup singer, preacher. Take your pick. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> You're right, Charlie. You're right, Charlie. You're right. It is one in a million, one in a million, one in a million. And I'm just wondering what Donna gets out of this. Some kind of comfort? That should she be arrested? Because Rashbaum has talked to her. Knows she might flee. And was actually knew she was going to flee. Was telling Charlie. It was pretty clear. They weren't saying it explicitly. If you listened last night. That Rashbaum was going to come and. Either come or talk to him on the phone come to the jail before he leaves Tallahassee and let Charlie know of his parents' plans. He had told Donna and Harvey that should they flee, they might get picked up, which I found very disappointing. I wanted Donna to think that she there was no chance that she was going to get arrested at the airport. I wanted to come to as a total surprise, but that was a little disappointing. <laughs> but I'm sure this family is always thinking positive, always thinking the best, that they're above the law, that they're too smart, too rich, too well-connected, that they'll never be caught. You heard Wendy on the stand. I'll never be indicted in this case. Don't think it's true anymore. And you can hear Donna saying, we talked to Dan Rashi. And we found out what they're thinking in Tallahassee, meaning Dan Rashbaum told us that they're thinking of indicting Donna and or Harvey next. And their plan was to end it all or to flee. They chose fleeing and they Rashbaum was fully aware that they were going to try to be go beyond the confines of the law and escape justice. And I would really like to know from a lawyer if there are any legal implications for Rashi, Daniel Rashbaum, for doing that. And I'm sure... His defense would be, I was talking 
to, I don't know if Donna would be considered part of his legal team. He is now, and maybe that's why he's included in the legal team, besides the fact that she thinks the sun rises and sets with him. But he was advising them as a lawyer that they could get picked up should they flee. I'm sure he would say, they told me they were going to flee, and they warned them that they could be picked up. But I would love to know if he could face any any kind of sanctions for, from that. I mean, it's so insane. I mean, you're right. It was <laughs> the fact that she had it, the fact that she had it there. So the one thing she buys in that whole store are the 5,000 items in our liquor store. Not Chardonnay, not Rosé, but with bourbon. Because most girls like bourbon. Girls don't even drink bourbon. They'll drink a glass of wine. They drink vodka. Uh, very few women are bourbon drinkers. This one is buying bottles, bottles of bullet bourbon as she leaves her house, goes out of the way, and passes by the crime scene. Okay, so I see Matt Schneider in the chat, who who is a lawyer, saying the state can't be in a better position after her testimony than before. Actually, maybe I can pull that up. Hold on one second, because it's really interesting what he's saying. He's addressing these Castigar issues, which I'm so curious about. There are cases constructing it more broadly than just using the evidence. The state can't be put in a better position than it would have been without the testimony, i.e. using her testimony to get other co-conspirators to make deals and then using their testimony against the person with the use immunity. But she said nothing. Have you? I'm just curious, Matt, if you've heard her testimony in Katie's trials and in Charlie's trials. She says nothing. She denies everything. How could the state be in a better position? The only, the only situation I see it is with the other conspirators is that it did make Charlie look more guilty. But for, but does that, mean that they that they can't charge her because her testimony made the others look more guilty really curious i hope he's still listening if you're still listening matt let me know what you what you think so that's very interesting and is really the best explanation i've heard of castigar issues And I've read a little bit about it myself, but I don't see how anything she said could implicate her. I don't know. Maybe he bailed out. Let me know, Matt, if you're still listening, if if, if the fact that her testimony helped the conspirators affects charging her. That's what I'm asking. Back to Donna, the backup singer, and Charlie, the maestro. Sure. Like, holy shit. Holy shit. Yeah. It had no. And if it was just someone who told her verbally to buy it, they would have been like, oh, I don't remember what I told her to buy. Yeah. Like, thank God she had that. Without that, it was, it was, they probably oh, yeah. delivered it an hour left. I mean, it would have been like, it's a, it's, everything's a coincidence. TV Joe. Okay, he's still on the coincidence thing. We have and <laughs> we'll have an answer. My chat here is a little a little behind the chat on my phone. So he's saying there are cases that talk about an issue if others were exposed to the testimony. This almost makes your head explode some of these legal things, right? <laughs> if others were exposed to the testimony of the immune of Wendy's testimony, 
like Katie's hearing about Wendy's testimony. Okay. So it means there are other cases that talk about an issue. If others were exposed to the testimony of the immune testimony, like Katie's hearing Wendy's testimony. Hmm. Gosh, this is maybe beyond my pay grade. Yeah. Huh. Huh. Maybe she will never be indicted. And we'll all, and it'll be like the, one of these weird cases where the person that obviously benefited the most. And when people say Donna put it into motion and Wendy was a passive participant, how can you be a per passive participant? participant in a case like this what do you you just like know what's going on and you feel kind of neutral about it it's being done for you but you're not interested how does that work how do you become passive in this case and if she were passive and if this was done for her, if this was all Donna's idea, all done for her, and she was knew about it, why would she drive by the crime scene? That tells me she's deeply invested in the outcome. And it's interesting, you never hear Georgia Kappelman say, oh, Wendy can't be indicted. Maybe she doesn't want to show her hand. Maybe she doesn't want to disappoint all of us because of these Castigar issues, eventually maybe she'll talk about it more when everybody else is tried. If Donna is the last one, is Donna really going to be the last one or is Harvey going to be the last one? And Wendy's going to just walk around with her whole family in prison for her? Something that benefited her so much? Wow. That would be a hard pill to, to swallow. TV repairman. And, and by the way, you know why a TV repairman is the world's worst alibi? Why? Half the time you schedule a repairman, you schedule them from 12 to 1, from 9 to 12. They call them and schedule, they bump you to the afternoon where they cancel on you. You would never have an alibi for a repairman. I mean, how many times do you, do you have a repair scheduled on delivery and they call and cancel it or change it? You know, if they should if they showed up at nine, they could have been left by nine thirty. Like my point is, they can also call you at nine and say we need to come to at one. Like, I mean, what did you need an alibi for? Yeah, but it just it kind of all fits in with the with the unluckiness of you saying that TV was five. And by the way, since it was such code, as soon as you say the TV is about five, I'm like, they wanted five thousand dollars? Like well, I, I right. give shit about, about what the TV five means. But I'm like, I blurred out exactly what what I'm trying to make sure you're saying is. I'm like, that's crazy. That's cool. You know, and like you don't mention TV till the third call, yet it's so important. So basically, if I didn't call you back a third time, I wouldn't have gotten that match in code word. You know, if you, if you dissect it like that, it makes sense. I don't know if you guys all caught that. It's all such drivel. But what he's saying, so funny. And thank you, Spitfire, for the super sticker. Really appreciate it. Really lets me devote as much time as I do to these live streams, super chats, and your support. Appreciate it. But what he's saying is because Donna didn't mention TV to the third call, remember the first call after the bump? This is what I think he's talking about. Because he didn't mention it till the third call. The first call, she's saying, it involves the two of us. And when Wendy's name is brought up, she's like, Society Page has a great video about this. She's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's like she put her hand on a hot stove verbally. She's rejecting it so intensely, the idea that Wendy might be involved in this. 
But she's like, ah, I think it involves the two of us. But because she didn't use the, I'm going to stop using the word code word. It's really more like double meaning word, TV. <laughs> Till the third call, it's not a code word or a double meaning. That's some logic there. Not the brightest bulb, Charlie. Not the most logical, reasonable. No, not reasonable. That's not the right word. Rational thinker. He'll just say, just like Wendy, everybody in this family will lie, say whatever sounds good at the time. And you have to really think about sometimes what they're saying. Like yesterday I was playing his phone call with his mother and he was saying, quoting Georgia saying, trust your gut. When looking at the evidence and he says, well, if I bet on a football team and I think that some football team is going to win over another football team, let's just, I can't even remember what football team, let's just use the Giants because I'm here in New York. The Giants are going to win over the Steelers. And I bet on it. Is that beyond a reasonable doubt? He's He thinks beyond a reasonable doubt is beyond any doubt anyway. But besides that, do you think really that these jurors were like a man's life hangs in the balance? I could send him away to prison for the rest of his life without parole, but I'm just going to be deliberating with the same care I would deliberate betting on a football team? That's what he really thinks? But it sounds good at the time. It sounds kind of persuasive. It, even for a second, believe it or not, for a second I had to be like, hmm. Because it sounded so good for about three seconds. <laughs> so they're, they are practice manipulators. Yeah, I would, I, would have, I would have missed the code if I only called me twice. So you called me, I called you back, and then I called you back the third time. So code word obviously meant nothing if you had to wait for the third call to tell them. So a repairman being an alibi was a plus that you need an alibi for, not at yeah. all. So like, they, what, what was she doing? She was worried they would suspect that she was the shooter. So she got the alibi. If she wanted an ally, she could have made an appointment for herself on the other side of the house that she would have kept, not worried that a repairman cancels on her. You know, if, if a repairman cancels on you, the alibi is all gone. I mean, but, but still, the crazy thing is the route she took and the time she took. And then as you turn, turn, make it a U turn on the street. Like, that was crazy. What is it? Like that's that's what that's what they dumped it down to. But they, there are some coincidences. There's no doubt. But I think people don't like hearing that there's coincidence. They don't like things explained by a coincidence, especially the morning and the Yeah. Like that time. Now it's just that the jury doesn't like the explanation that it's a coincidence. Not that a coincidence is totally improbable and near impossible, all the coincidences in this case. Yeah. You know why they don't like it, Charlie? Let me explain it to you. Let me explain it to you like you're a toddler. They don't like it because they've lived on planet Earth. And they know that the chances of the Latin kings going out and killing someone that they're not familiar with targeting someone, not in your immediate family, in your extended family, is so remote on spec and then putting you on a payment plan is ne next to, you know when that's happened? I can say confidently, never. That's never happened in the history of the world. So when your defense is something that's never happened in the history of the world, and then they have you on 
wiretaps talking about it in code and the case and the state's case makes perfect sense and your explanation sounds like something that you thought up you you i'm talking about you charlie thought up yourself in jail and a lawyer who normally doesn't take these kind of cases who's never tried a murder case in his life wants to make his bones on why do we all know the name daniel rashbaum now because of this case and not only did it make him exceedingly rich now he's going to take donna's case it also made him famous and i find a lot of these defense attorneys especially the ones that aren't so good go back to my interview with da former deputy da john lewin i think he actually is still a da deputy da he's king of the cold cases he's been demoted for speaking out against george gascon's pro criminal policies he's been moved to trying smaller cases in inglewood thanks to doing the right thing and alerting the public that it's a safety hazard what they're doing in the DA's office there but what he was saying is a lot of these famous defense attorneys i asked him i said is there any difference in going up against you've gone up against some of these really famous defense attorneys like dick dugarin can't think of a lot of other ones off the top of my head but he has gone up a lot of up against a lot of these famous LA defense attorneys is there any difference between going up against them and sort of a more lesser known lawyer not sort of a lesser known lawyer defense lawyer and he said yeah there is a difference he said the famous ones aren't very good they're easy to beat So I don't know I don't know what the pattern is there but certainly I would say Daniel Rashbaum would be right in the line of not so good famous now defense attorneys. It's all of those things Charlie. all of those things are just you know and then also by the way the book that she wrote in 2008 like she wrote the book 6 years earlier like, that's right. Maybe 2008, 2009. I mean, did she even have her kids at that point? Ben wasn't born until July 09. So, so she may have only had one kid at that time. She may have been pregnant with the second one. Yeah. But, but either way, I mean, like, kind of crazy that she put that line in the book and named this, named this obviously named the city after Tallahassee. That it sounded just like Tallahassee to me. She read it out like it makes the shoe fits. She's not busy talking about herself, in a place that she feels stuck on the way to civilization with her professor husband. Like, you start putting those things together. I mean, look, none of them have fucking anything to do with me. Like, nothing. Nothing. But there, since it is her. Okay, they're just going on and on about Wendy. Can you imagine? And this is just to note that this is the same day that Donna bought her ticket to Vietnam. November 7th. Little did she know that that would be, that she was really buying a ticket to jail. Truth for the boys is, oh, and thank you, Society Page, for the nice compliment. Truth for the boys is saying, another thing I think has never happened, somebody asking you to choose bullet bourbon as a gift. Right, and we know Wendy in her police interview is saying that she was so unfamiliar with alcohol. Jeff Lacoste disagrees. He called her an alcoholic and said she drank her dinner most nights. 
asking you to choose bullet bourbon as a gift. We know that she said she talked to the clerk about what kind she could buy because she was so unfamiliar with alcohol because harsh flavor and overprice buy for buy for Rosea or Rosea or Maker's Mark people. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I can see them saying we need bourbon. We need this. We need whatever. There's a list of things to get in the stock, the bar party. But I can't imagine them asking for bullet bourbon. And it seems like this call supports it because they're so mad at her for doing all these things that show her hand driving by the crime scene. Who would do that? But it seems like Wendy as a antisocial personality really loves flirting with the edge showing her hand just a little bit and then denying it, telling Jeffrey Lacoste that her brother looked into hiring a hitman a year before. I love that they got ripped off, that the hitman just took their money. Boy, Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia, I bet they're so mad upon hearing that, that they didn't do that. <laughs> of course, Sigfredo Garcia couldn't because... He was connected with Katie. But what was Charlie really going to do? Shoot him? Himself? Have someone shoot him? Come on. He should have just taken his money and, and, and split. If you wanted money from this. But Wendy likes to show just a little bit, a little bit of what's going on so she can deny it and say it's, it's my word against Jeffrey Lacoste. I'm the lawyer. He's just the jealous ex-boyfriend. Who are you going to believe? I'm the lawyer that works with women who are victims of trafficking. Jeffrey Lacoste is just the jealous, angry ex-boyfriend. Who are you going to believe? In addition to cloaking herself, with the identity of a victim, she likes to just flirt with danger just a little bit. These are people who are easily bored, who need very high stimu stimulus. So going by the crime scene, not only could she not help herself, but she wanted to be where the action was was. She wanted to see the blood. She wanted to see Dan Markell dead. It's really dark. And it's hard to go there as a caring, feeling person. But that's the way these people think. It's very dark inside her head. Such a pretty package. What's going on there? Same with Donna. Very dark. Listen to the way Charlie and Donna talk. I mean, just the language alone. Who would talk to their mother like that? I'm going to take a break because I just really need a little bit of a palate cleanser. This is a lot of Charlie Adelson. Forgive me, but... <laughs> I never have I needed a break more. I woke up with him, his chatter, his endless repetitive chatter. The intensity and the repetition is something I did not expect. How their conversations would all go around and around in circles, always the same topic, same talking points. Like I said, I woke up with a headache from it this morning. Just a head pounding. I've had it all day. How Donna? Because she's exactly the same. That's how Donna doesn't get a headache. Because she's exactly the same. Exactly the same kind of repetitive monologue is going on in her head. Ditto Harvey. All right. 
I will be back. I will meet you on the other side of the break. Don't go anywhere. If you are enjoying this episode of my True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Not long enough. Not long enough, that break. <laughs> Unreal. I think I'm going to just listen to a little bit more of this. Then I have another victim impact letter written for Dan Markell to read. If you guys have questions for me, just put a cat emoji in front of it and I can answer it. I might have just a little bit of a question and answer time if you guys want it, up for it. But this is just going around and around in circles. The same thing. Wendy is the cause of all evil. It's not that they all participated in a murder for hire plot that ended Dan Markell's life, a beloved, important, influential member of the community and a beloved father and a really special person by all accounts. It's, this would have gone so well. So I was watching Court TV and shout out to Carl Steinbeck was on it with a behavioral analysis. Is that right? Body language expert, I think would be a better way to put it. And Jody Arias's lawyer, the one who left, I can't remember. Oh, Kurt Nurmi. Is that right? Was he part of the panel? I hope so. I hope I'm right. I hope my memory is right. And they were all saying that Wendy looks very guilty and should be indicted immediately. What are what are we all waiting for? Movements up here in Tallahassee, you have to assume that everybody's connected. You know what I mean? Like it has to be. There's no way that you know those are independent of me. You know, and then they then they go back to tie a motor. They don't they don't get it. No. <laughs> No, they don't. I mean, who knows? Maybe somebody will do a, a book or a movie and actually take our side and like and maybe get it. I haven't. I I've thought of it. Thought of it. I mean, it's like you know, maybe somebody will like. But listen, if the jury didn't act improperly or the judge didn't make any bad rulings, I didn't have an ineffective counsel. I had a great counsel. Yes. So you have to have a, a reason to appeal the case. So even he knows that he can't appeal the case. This is what I love. And thank you very much. Glammy girl. Glamis girl. My apologies. Excellent coverage, Roberta. Thank you. For the super sticker. Really appreciate it. Someone's asking me what I thought happened, what really happened. What really happened? What really happened is I think that Wendy and Donna, and they all discussed it. And Charlie, who had been so embarrassed by being ripped off earlier, and he really is the Fredo. See the society pages take where she puts Charlie as Fredo. Got to prove himself. This is a guy who didn't apply himself in dental school, had to needed help to graduate, get his degree, 
had to be hired by his dad's practice, working at eight or nine different practices instead of having his own practice as a periodontist. And that's why he walks around with, in scrubs without their status symbols. Who are they? They're empty. They don't have an inner life. They don't have interests. They don't produce anything. Do you get what I'm saying? They just have their, for Harvey and Charlie, it's so much about being a doctor. And you saw on the stand, George asked him, should I call you doctor? Yes, he still wants to be called doctor. After this murder conviction, there goes his medical license. So enjoy it while you have it, Charlie, because it's going to be taken away pretty soon. All right, I'm going to listen to a little bit more of this, then I'll get to your questions, and we can look at another really beautiful victim impact letter. And that was written for Katie's sentencing. Other than you had a bunch of coincidences and a stupid jury. Yeah. yeah. Like, but, but through all of those things that they were building in, like, that was their, that was their, they weren't allowed to bring them in because it spoke to motive. It spoke to state of mind. It spoke to, like, nothing to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just like it's, it's so it's so crazy that it, it's you can't even imagine that it's real. I mean, it is. It's just so crazy. Yeah. No, I'm here, and I'm like, I, I I literally never, especially after this weekend, in a million fucking years, like I was basically almost like. And the best, I didn't feel like I was in jail. I literally like was in such a good headspace and was like went and played basketball too tall. I hadn't played basketball with them and months. I played a lot of games. You know, given my fourth away. Yeah, I never played four. I gave my coat away. Made a couple phone calls to people I've talked with a long time. Kind of like hearing positive feedback. Like, that's why I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, Dan, Dan's so happy with how the case is going. Right. right. Like, saying to me, step of the way, okay, if, if, I, if I knew, if you asked me a week ago if I was going to be in this place, at this point in the case, would I be happy? He was a big step. And then I literally, like, after I testified, he's like... He yeah. was like, he's like, we, we're going to win this case. We're going to win. I mean, when they did their opening, he wrote on a piece of paper to me with a marker. He writes, we will win. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, Kate, like, look, the worst you're going to do is a hung jury. The worst you're going to do is a hung jury. And I'm thinking, like, look, we had a good jury consultant, get good people, and yeah. an awesome closer. Like we're we're gonna be kicking some ass and closing. It's you know his view is this his strength is closing. His strength is closing. Can you imagine? He thought his strength was puzzle pieces. I think that's a good point to end it there. But exactly what I said when he really was counting on the jury and listen back to. Last two nights of calls, they were obsessed with the jury. This jury consultant was going to fix it all for them. And I'd love to hear what you guys think, but I don't think that's too good lawyering. Saying that we're doing great and the case is going great when it's not. Some of what you do as a lawyer is get your client to realistically look at his case and his chances. And Dan Rashbaum going in there and Kate 
and I'm sorry I'm forgetting her last name. I'm sure someone in the chat will let me know what Charlie Adelson's other lawyer, Kate, whatever her last name was. <laughs> They're both telling him, you're going to win and writing it with a marker. What is that? Some kind of Tony Robbins positive thinking talk? That was their strategy to get Josh Dubin and go back to my episode, Charlie Adelson's Million Dollar Gamble. And I don't know anyone who has done what I've done, which is look at all the famous Innocence Project cases that I can read the transcripts of in the last six years. My life devoted it to. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty strange, pretty odd. But that's my interest. And one is more guilty than the next. These You have to understand that Josh Dubin was a jury consultant for Harvey Weinstein. These are the kind of people that they are on team criminal. They want to get out, get off or get out. Harvey Weinstein's of the world and even worse, much worse. And they'll do it by any means necessary. If it is a, they'll go after whatever the strongest evidence is. So if it's a confession, it's a false confession. If it is an eyewitness testimony, look at the Tim Hennis case. Elizabeth Loftus, beloved Innocence Project expert, in his second trial totally demolished the eyewitnesses in Tim Hennis's case. Spoiler alert, he's on military death row now until DNA was invented. That told quite a different story. She's not, she's still not sure with the DNA evidence if it could have been corrupted. If it's DNA evidence, then it's corrupted or there's another explanation. They were having a secret affair. They go after whatever the strongest piece of evidence is. Sometimes they even will go to witnesses and get them to recant years and years later saying that they're all wrong, guilting the crap out of them. That's how this movement works. All so they can clean up in our civil courts when they sue for their wrongful conviction. So I'm not asking anyone to take my word. I'm just asking you to look at the transcripts yourself and see what you find. So that's what they were really, 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 really um, here. Let me see. Do you agree, starting with Top Cat, do you agree that Donna and Wendy have deep-seated resentment towards each other even before the murder? That's so interesting, Top Cat. I've never thought of that. Certainly all mothers and daughters have a tense relationship. And I do think that Wendy would certainly resent all that control. They're very alike. And yeah, I think you're probably right. I would have to think about it some more. But I think, yeah, my instinct is that you're right. But now it can't be that Charlie did something wrong in testifying or he wasn't very good because everything they do is perfect. Their lawyer is the best lawyer. The Adelson, <laughs> I'm sorry, the Adelson Institute, Institute, Institute for Dental, <laughs> Dental Surgery is the best. Everything they do is the best. Anyone outside, outside the cult is is not one of us and the Markells by not, by making the food such an issue. And Craig pointed out to me, look at the way Donna deals with food. That's one of her complaints about the food in, in jail. Her weight, she wanted to join Weight Watchers, according to Wendy. She's an unreliable narrator, but who would make up a story like that, that Weight Watchers wouldn't accept you? because you weren't overweight.
And there's so many issues around control with this family. Yes, yeah, stupid jury is right. Who said that? That's Glamis Girl, stupid jury, right? It's all the jury's fault. They had their heart really set on manipulating this jury from the beginning. And Josh Dubin got half the jury thrown out on the first day. And by the way, I'd like to correct something. So either last night or the night before, I misunderstood something Charlie said about a juror. He said there was a juror related to the 911 operator and they had to use, and what I said is they had to accept, the state was ready to accept this relative of the 911 operator on the jury. She said she could be impartial. And they had to use one of their strikes. So I thought she was on the jury. She was not. So, because he was complaining about it. What'd she know to drive by at that time? And why does her tree fell down argument, why is that so poor? Why didn't she run out and try to? I was watching the documentary Three Identical Strangers, and there's a part of it, spoiler alert, where someone, there's a tragedy, let's I'll put it that way, there's a tragedy, and one of the brothers sees the crime, sees all these police, there's triplets, sees all the police officers at his triplets, one of his triplet brother's houses, knows something is wrong and tries to run in and is stopped by the cops. Why wasn't Wendy doing that? Why wasn't she getting out of her car and trying to run in? Why, and as Donna says, why didn't she call the daycare? If there are more questions, if you don't mind, if you can just write them again, so hard to scroll back amongst all the other, and please put a cat here. Isabella Rivera, is Wendy dating a guy named George? Yes, I found that out. I don't know anything about him. What I've heard is he's been wrongly identified as a billionaire or millionaire son and someone put up the wrong picture. So it's not the George that's connected to the family. That's a son of someone connected to the family. It's another George. I wonder if she'll ever slip and call him Georgia. Good question. Very good question. Yeah. Wendy's relationships with her female friends are so insanely intense. And have you guys heard the audio where Charlie says that he didn't recognize Wendy in court and he was flirting with this girl and she's smiling at him and Daniel Rashbaum has to tell him, that's your sister? That's your sister? He doesn't recognize his own sister in court? I can, when my mother comes to visit in New York, I can recognize her walk, even her legs. <laughs> She's got great legs. Didn't inherit that, but thanks, Mom. Anyway, but she, I can recognize her walk three blocks away before I can even see her face. He can't recognize his own sister in court. What is that story about? This family is so weird. And the relationship between Charlie and Wendy is so intense, like, like lovers. It's bizarre. He's flirting with his sister before he knows it's her. It is she? What is, what is the point of that story? Narcissistic supply. Bugs Bunny's brother says, narcissistic supply. Excuse me. Use up the person till they have exhausted their value and then move on to the next person to use. That's very much Wendy's strategy. And it seems like she has created uh, some real advocates around her. 
so she can do very little. She doesn't have to give interviews. Tova Walsh will do it for her, right? Can he appeal? Tanya Smith says, is asking, can he appeal? Yes, but on what grounds? He's already saying, on what grounds can I appeal? Because usually they go right to ineffective assistant of, of counsel. And he's saying, Rashi did a great job. I was perfect. It's the jury. So they're looking for a juror. He says in another recorded conversation, unless a juror admits that something was done wrong in the jury, which makes me so suspicious about that Mr. Blood juror who was nodding along with the defense and shaking his head no. And the minute after the verdict, he writes to the judge and says there was a group chat that needs to be investigated among the jurors, probably just to plan out where they were going to go to lunch or should someone be late, they could contact another juror and let the judge know. It's very useful to be in those kind of group chats if you're a juror. But he's saying that maybe they were talking about the case. Makes me think that that juror might have been, was he a plant? I don't put anything above Charlie Adelson and this defense team. They seem, in my mind, don't sue me, Rashbaum, to be very comfortable working either on the edge of the law or a little outside it. Craig is asking, what is it about that case that interests so many people? That's what I'm thinking about a lot. I think that so many of the people that follow this case have dynamics in their family that are similar to the Adelson family. They either have a mother that's like this, that's overbearing. They've dealt with a family. They've married into a family like this. And I also think that it's so clear who the villains are. They're so villainous, this family. They're so easy to hate. Even Charlie Adelson is saying that in the calls. They hated our guts. They hated my sister's guts. They Hated your guts. Yeah, we do. You're right. He's very aware, like a real psychopath, how people are feeling and what they're thinking. He's right on the money with what they're feeling, what they're thinking. Or like a good con man, even you could argue. And so clear who the heroes are. Dan Markell is incredibly accomplished. Their family are all so lovable. And then you have the issue of the children. And I think a lot of mothers are watching this. And it's their worst nightmare. And grandmothers. Being alienated from your own children and having such an evil family raise them. And what's going to become of them? We know Wendy is pretty smart. I hate to admit that. Although I was wrong about Charlie. Boy, does he seem <laughs> not too bright. But compared to most criminals, most criminals are not all that bright in these cases. So there's many elements, but Wendy's pretty smart. Dan was genius. And that these kids have incredible promise and in what's going to become of them raised in a family like this. I think that's some of it. And of course, just all the intrigue with the bump, with the code words, with the way it was planned. Usually murders and murder cases or thrill kills, crimes of passion. Like look at, who am I thinking of? It's not Diane Downs. It's the one who was married to a lawyer. She just, Betty, Betty Broderick just came in and shot them. There was tons of harassment beforehand, but she didn't plan it out. It was so meticulously planned, this crime. I think that's some of it. 
Truth or the Boys, how do you think Charlie will react when he is on a recorded call after finding out Donna is arrested fleeing the country? Uh, well, I think he knew that she was fleeing. I think he'll be disappointed. And I think the question is, who is he going to blame for Donna getting arrested fleeing the country? And we know that those neighbors, I need to get Donna's indictment again and read that out, read that part out. But it's in Donna's indictment that they called some neighbors that they hadn't spoken to, meaning Harvey and Donna called some neighbors that they hadn't spoken to in years or very seldom in years. And we're saying we're planning to leave the country. Don't tell Charlie. They're like, why would we tell Charlie? We're not in touch with Charlie in jail. What? Don't tell Charlie. And they called it in to law enforcement. And that's how law enforcement or the state, I can't remember if it's law enforcement or the state's attorney. I think it was the state's attorney and said they're planning to flee and alerted them. So everyone thinks it's really the jailhouse calls, but it's really these neighbors that we have to thank for Donna being arrested. What I don't understand is how they planned this murder so meticulously and didn't plan their escapes. They planned their escape so poorly, but it speaks to entitlement. And all the positive thinking, they think positive. They're the Tony Robbins of murderers, <laughs> of murderers' families. They're thinking positive all the time. Charlie's trial, he's going to be acquitted. Everything's going to go great. And we're going to get away with this. Wendy seems to be doing the same thing. Why doesn't Charlie, Glamis Girl, why doesn't Charlie bring up the fact that they didn't contact law enforcement, an attorney for advice, a private investigator. Do you think the jury considered this as evidence? Yeah, I think they considered everything. Because you can look at that as evidence, what you know to be true. We like to think that everybody handles situations differently, and that's true, but it's on a spectrum of normalcy. And it's not normal that after the bump that they didn't contact law enforcement. And Charlie's story didn't make any sense that he was so quick to pay the extortion and so slow and pondering and looking at, looking at every angle to pay $5,000, which would have been chump change, right? According to him, that's just a month's worth of extortion. Why? <laughs> right? So it's not in his usual behavior. And I think a jury can look at all of that. J.P. Chunkalunkus? <laughs> Great name. So you know what? Uh, one of the calls they referred to someone as three. Any idea who three might be? Yeah, that is actually, sounds like a code and not a double meaning. Yeah, I don't know. If anyone has any idea, put it in the chat. That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. And I've not gotten to that. Do you know which, which recording that's on? Because I haven't gone through all of them. I've gone through a lot of them, but I haven't gone through all of them. They are long and repetitive. I really wasn't aware. I really thought all of these calls would be like the clips that we heard from Donna in the beginning. And I did think there would be some what you had for lunch, but I was not prepared for the repetition. I mean, it's like, I feel like I'm running a marathon listening to these. Like it's exhausting listening to Charlie go over, 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 over again. The same talking points, same arguments, and the same poor arguments. Oh, yes, that story was so weird and creepy. 
who even thinks that and then to repeat it to their mother. Which is, I can't, I don't know. Yeah, I, oh, the story of hitting on his sister. That is bizarre. I mean, I know we've all speculated that Wendy has had face work, but to not recognize your own sister, it's almost like with our relatives, we almost recognize them by smell. Bugs Bunny's brother says, and Wendy's friends bow to her. Yeah, someone said that she has followers, not friends. I think that was a good, a good summation. All right. Have we done it? Have we done it with the questions? All right. I think we've done it. I think I'm just going to, you have, yeah, I think I'm just going to read this letter and we can call it a night. Tomorrow I have off. So trying out a schedule Tuesday. Oh, wait, one more. Sorry. Tuesday and Friday, I'm going to try to take off. Lelia Jade says, is George Wendy's boyfriend? No, no, that was wrong. So that is who he's not. So George is not Wendy's boyfriend, the son of billionaire Michael Fernandez of Coral Gables. Yeah, no, that's what I've heard. That is wrong. But someone knows better. I've heard that is wrong. I know it hit the Reddit pages. The Reddit, the murder of Dan Markell. Someone else is asking. I re-listened to Rashbaum's clothes today because they are so happy with it. I do not recommend doing that for mental health. You know, I thought that, thanks, Truth for the Boys, I thought that was two and a half hours. It's an hour and 45 minutes. So that will tell you that my memory of it is like two and a half hours. I added an hour on, tacked an hour onto it. It was so overly long and poor. And if you go back to yesterday's episode, I played just a little clip about how to do a closing argument with a law professor. Someone's asking Top Cat, how long do you think Charlie's girlfriends on, on the outside will stay supportive of him? I would say as long as it benefits them. So as long as they're getting something out of them. So they... So Charlie seems to attach himself to people just like himself who are really interested in what he's interested in, which is money, status, power, things. And as long as he can provide something, they will stay loyal to him. As long as he's useful in, in some way to them, they will stay loyal. But they're not, they're all very, very not bright. That's the nicest way I can put it. I'm struck by they're very coarse, very hard, <laughs> and like a little bit like Katie, although I don't know. There's a, sort of like the more naive part of myself wants to think that Katie might improve, might grow in in prison. Probably not likely, but I think if we have a chance of anyone really she should she's protecting her own image and we now know that charlie's family paid for her lawyers i still haven't presented the legal filings with that maybe not tomorrow but maybe wednesday i'll do that but it's in the legal filings from the state there, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, that they're asserting that Charlie paid for Katie's lawyers, which we all kind of knew. But Katie testified on the stand that her parents paid for it. How? Yeah, this is the million-dollar question, Rational Party. Do you think Wendy will flee and leave the boys? Right? That was the most interesting thing about Donna, right? She killed, and that to me that said that 
Donna really, the whole thing about relocating the boys was not as important to Donna as it was made out to be because she was willing to leave them and flee to Vietnam without them. Why didn't they all flee as a family? But we know now Wendy's living with Harvey, so that would be interesting. What a sitcom that would be. What would that be called? <laughs> my my murderous family <laughs> evading the law, a sitcom. Well, will she flee? I don't think so. It's the thing that we would do. So we're sort of putting our selves, we would protect ourselves. Of course, I don't think anyone in this chat, I hope not, would do such a crime. But we would like to think that we would flee. I think she would take the boys if she did flee, but I don't think she will. She likes parading around with her nose in the air saying, you can't catch me. I'm too good. I'm that good. And I didn't do it. Because to flee, she knows as a lawyer, to flee is an admission of guilt. Con shows consciousness of guilt. She's not going to do that. We would do it, but she won't. She doesn't love them based on her actions. Yeah, I don't think she loves them either. She didn't like spending time with them. She didn't enjoy parenting. She likes the idea of them. She likes using them as a prop to show Craig Isom. She likes using the moniker of mom. But she doesn't really like mothering. And a lot of narcissistic mothers don't. They're just a reflection of her. And according to Donna in these calls, the boys have become very, or one of the boys has become very quiet. It's close to Charlie. Very interesting case that I've covered that's like this case, little bit. And of course now is the Marshall case, Maria Marshall, the murder of Maria Marshall, New Jersey. There was a made-for-TV movie about it. And actually, Robbie Marshall, the son of Howard Marshall, who had his wife murdered, he was in the most sloppy way. He was caught by the phone calls that he made to the middleman in Louisiana. And there was a big push, innocence push, to get him off death row that was successful. And he died right before he could have his first parole hearing. Oh, no, no, no. He had his first parole hearing, but he was rejected. And then he died right after it. So he died before he could get out. I think it's called my episode. You can look at that episode. It's called, is it Howard Marshall? No, Howard Marshall. What is his first name? It's Marshall. I'm forgetting it. Anyway doesn't matter what the murderer's name is. As long as I got the victim's name is, I <laughs> feel like I'm doing okay. Anyway, it's whatever his name, Marshall, murdered his wife almost by accident because he said everything like that was a coincidence and an accident, same as Charlie Adelson. But the kids all supported him through his trial. And he was on trial with the hitman who got off with a phony alibi used his wife's dental appointment receipt and got off and he had the hitman's wife living in the house while he was on trial for murder and he got convicted but afterwards the two oldest sons turned against him and i wonder if wendy's sons will be waking up they seem very smart and i would think you're very curious at that age the early teens. And I can see them turning against her and waking up to this. But it's really hard when you don't have any other parent. And that's the only family that you know. How do you fully turn against the only thing that you've known, the only parenting that you know? We know that abused children will reach when they're being taken, basically rescued, they will still reach for their abusive parent and cry out for them. So 
Lynn says this is important. Javier says this is about Charlie's attorney. He ripped Charlie off because he wanted to make money. Most attorneys wanted the money and they don't care about the guy. Um, so he's saying that Rashbaum took the money and didn't care about Charlie. Well, I don't think the Adelson family, then he's in good company because I don't think the Adelson family cares about anyone else either. And I don't think even within the Adelson family, we saw this, if Harvey and Donna really cared about Charlie, why would they leave him, right? So it's like every person out for themselves and then they're all disparaging Wendy for being out for herself, just like they are. Roberta, at one of Katie McBanawa's trials, I remember Wendy Adelson saying she drove by Dan Markell's house sometimes to accept the divorce. Yeah, right. Or something to that ef effect. Oh, right. Oh, I know exactly what you're saying. She said to process the divorce or come to terms with the divorce. Linda, I wish I <laughs> I wish I had a bell to ring. Like ding, 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 ding. Like is her way of coming to terms with the divorce. It's some sort of language like that. Process it, come to terms with the divorce, right? Or something to that effect. So now we have three reasons why she drove down to Trescott. Great point, Linda. Right. She just frequently did that. On that day, she didn't need to come to terms with the divorce or emotionally process it. There's, it's. Does anyone remember exactly what the phrase is? It's really like a. It's really like a kind of Gwyneth Paltrow, consciously uncoupling kind of phrase. All right, let me just read this thing. Wait. Let me just read this uh, victim impact statement if there are no more questions. And I, I think I've been on for two hours and 13 minutes. But I'm not in a rush. So if people have more questions, I'm happy to answer them. But, you know, all good things do have to come to a close. All right, here we go. Okay, so this is from Ethan Lieb. Your Honor, Dan Markell was a friend, was my friend and colleague, and I still can't figure out how to be whole without him. He was a present and intuitive and loving. He was present and intuitive and loving and nudging. My apologies. He found time for me and our relationship in the most creative manner and performed friendship in ways that always felt genuine and from the right place. Although I literally wrote a book about friendship, I have always been chastened to know that he knew more about it than I ever would or could, and I've gone from intimidated by Dan when I first met him to wholly admiring him in short order. And, but I now have to remain in a permanent state of grieving. I feel cheated because our friendship is now stuck in time. There was so much growing to do together and I miss his companionship so much. He is still teaching me and reaching from beyond the grave. I can reread him, think about what he would say about personal or professional challenges, conjure his goodwill, in the, and I take comfort that his vivacity in life 
reverberations in death, but I am in mourning still. My life at work and at home is thinner, less vital, less analyzed, and less shared. I miss my friend. Beautiful letter by Ethan Lieb. And that was given as a victim impact statement in Katie's trial. So thank you so much for listening. I will be back with another episode. And thank you all for your great questions and comments and exploring this case with me. I will be back Wednesday off tomorrow with another episode. Have a great night, everybody.